probabilistic chip. There was three probabilistic bits or, or three pop, you know, thermodynamic neurons, whatever you want to call them, a couple designs. And then, and then the little snakes you see are like control lines uh, to control the parameters, the tilt, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, that first chip, you know, everything worked out. We have some cool experiments. And really, it's like if you had a different supply chain, you know, you might want to do things in superconductors. Of course, like the problem is you have to, to cool it. Ideally, you could use a much smaller fridge, but, you know, it's not, it's not as dense as, as we like it, right? This chip is basically macroscopic. You can see the, you know, the details like by the naked eye. And so what we had to do, well, so, okay, the reason we gave a shit uh, <laughs> was that, you know, people are like, there's like these crazy, like this crazy space-like race to have the most efficient or the biggest transformer uh, possible. And our theory was like, if we open source it, then maybe the governments will race to build a crazy superconducting supercomputer to have the most energy efficient transformer. And so, you know, we mapped how to break down a trans- Hold, pause, chat, chat, pause. Okay, did, did he just say that their whole objective here was, hey, maybe if we build this, it'll force governments into making a, a, an AI supercomputer, a super inefficient AI supercomputer? Hold up, chat. <laughs> um, pause. Are you just such a good person that you just decided that, oh, we're going to force the governments to make one of these things? I don't know if I like this guy more now or I'm just super suspicious of him now. Uh, I want to, let's repeat that. Let's go back like 10 seconds. Sit, then maybe the governments will race to build a crazy superconducting supercomputer to have the most energy efficient transformer. And so, you know, we met. I'm all about that chat. Yeah. Let's get our governments to build a super crazy superconducting supercomputer. I got to go ahead and just say I, in, my, in the back of my mind, I'm getting an itch. It feels like they might already have one. And the other thing I want to point out is that I'm not convinced that what these guys are doing is novel either. I am convinced that they're doing something that's novel to them. Yes. But I'm not convinced that if this is real and this is like a more efficient way of measuring the ether, using a computer to measure the ether, then the government's already got it. <laughs> Lockheed Martin's already figured this out. In fact, what I really want to know is I want to have Charles Chase in the room with this guy. I want Charles Chase in the room with this guy, and I just want to watch them. I want to be like Steve Irwin. Crikey. It's a, it's a rogue. We've got a rogue Lockheed Martin fellow, and he's talking to the extropic engineer about thermodynamics, stochastic thermodynamics. Let's see how this plays out. Let's see who will win this battle. Right? That's how I feel about this. I just want to watch them in the room together, and I just want to glean information. What a rare sight. Charles has gone and asked him, does he think that the thermal fluctuations are related to zero point energy? Mapped how to break down a transformer and its operations into superconducting thermalization physics. And then we did some benchmarks. I think those lines are out of order. Um, it's like the legends messed up, but, but you know, the problem, this is just simulations, right? It's, it's you scale to a freaking room size computer of this type. Uh, it would be crazy, right? Like the energy efficiency gains are like insane. They're like 10 million X plus, right? 100 million X plus. So, so that's cool, um, but obviously it's not tractable because you got to like super cool it and you wouldn't be able to put it in your phone or something. Uh, and so we uh, basically we had to figure out how go. to port this technology and what we learned to room temperature uh, and in silicon uh, in order to make sure we could deploy it at scale and mass manufacture it. And, uh, you know, like a year ago, I put out this plot and, and then we were manufacturing our chips. And then, you know, as we was reported and, and wired, we, you know, we, we, we successfully... Uh, created a bunch of new primitives in silicon. There's probabilistic bits. There's other silicon primitives in there. Uh, and basically, uh, I'll talk about it, but we're going to give people access to this chip in a dev kit uh, uh, very soon. Uh, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, I don't know if this is a movie, but you know, you can see the, the probabilistic bit. I think that dev kit already happened. That's that weird box we were looking at. Signal there. It's basically we control how much time the, the signal spends in zero or one, and we have like pretty good control there and like sort of reliable manufacturing. That's kind of the that's kind of the hard part. And if you get your components right, then you can scale. Of course, like none of this matters if we can't scale it, right? And so not only do we have to scale the hardware, but we got to scale the models, right? And so how are we going to scale the hardware? So this is like, uh, yeah, I mean, this is our game plan. So yeah, so 1,000x year over year, uh, number of degrees of freedom. So we start off with three probabilistic neurons or probabilistic bits. We have 300 components, uh, probabilistic comp degrees of freedom on the, on the new chip, and then uh, we're designing a chip that's coming out next year with uh, in the order of millions. 
right? And so, yeah, yeah, we're scaling this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, no, no tweeting this yet. Uh, yeah, eyes only, please. Don't, no leaking. Uh, and uh, you gotta, you gotta also scale the algorithms, right? So, you know, there's a, there's a paper from Google called uh, Denoising Recovery Likelihood. It's like chaining EBMs to, uh, to replace diffusion models and using like, 100 times less steps, right? And so, uh, basically, we like supercharge that algorithm for our hardware. And um, so, the next slide, you're gonna see one thousandth of this chip, this next chip. We simulated it running the algorithm, and um, you could basically do what we call uh, denoising thermodynamic models uh, in a way that's much more efficient. DDPM is like a diffusion model. Uh, the circles are running on GPU and the axes are running on our computer. Uh, again, this is in simulation. Um, but essentially, it's, uh, you, know, you know, if you run a cheap algorithm, it's 1,000x better. If you run an expensive algorithm, it's like 100 million x more energy efficient. And this is sort of the number of uh, joules you need, you know, how much energy per sample. And so you could have, you know, more generation, more throughput in parallel or... So basically what he's saying is that because the old system of doing generative AI, the way the old system of generative AI works is it's almost like, uh, what did they say? Transformation or something like that, where it has to go through these chains one at a time, right? And this is what makes it so inefficient, makes it take so long. It makes it take a huge amount of energy. Their system can skip all that. They can skip all that. So that huge chain you saw, they skip all that. And so when you look at these numbers here on the screen, they're talking about efficiency levels a million times more efficient in the energy consumption. So we look at the energy consumption down here and we see like under 10 uh, joules per sample and it goes all the way down to 10 to the minus seven. So every minus, every minus you see increase adds another zero before the, or after the decimal point. So 0 0.00000. So minus seven has minus has seven zeros. 0 0.7 zeros and then one. So the amount of energy these things are using is significantly less than current architecture. This is the kind of thing where I look at this and I go, wow, if that's real, if that's true, then that is, a, that is such a huge amount that there's definitely value there. There's definitely value there. We still are gonna need fusion. And even if those numbers aren't accurate, even if it's only half correct, it's still huge. My bigger question would be, is there some kind of larger reason why this won't work? Like, is the microchip going to break down after it's been used for 15 minutes or something like that? You know, is there some kind of, like, what's the catch? What's the catch? Is there a red flag here? Because otherwise I look at this and I'm going, this seems like a no brainer. Or overclocking time using more energy. But, um, but yeah, this, this was, I think, for CIFAR. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, this is pretty exciting. Like, we're designing this and we're gonna, you know, have it next year uh, from the manufacturer and you could run some pretty pretty interesting algorithms on it. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to, um, you know, finally be able to give people early access to the software and some of the hardware. Um, so, you know, people ask us like when, when the dev kit will be ready and when they'll be able to like experiment with the dynamic computers. And essentially it's this summer, so summer 2025. Yeah, let's go. And, uh, Got the chip wow. right here, so we're packaging it into a dev kit, and essentially you're gonna be able to have it on your desk and just plug it in your computer with ethernet and start hacking. Called a Bolson distribution, which is this exponential distribution there that is normalized, right? So you, what we're doing is programmable bowls that have parameters of how you shape the bowl, and we're letting electrons be our bouncy balls, hop around this high dimensional landscape, and then we get samples from the computer. A hundred times less steps, so there's a paper uh, diffuse, denoising recovery likelihood with EBMs. Uh, it's a paper by Google a couple years ago. Uh, but you could do basically diffusion models with a chain of denoising EBMs, right? So this machine can do basically everything that, everything like diffusion models can do, but better. So that's pretty great. That's a lot of applications. The next slide is very fresh, just specially cooked for today. It's very preliminary. So yeah, you know, wait for the paper. Thermo superconducting thermo AI hardware. Our first prototype, our most macroscopic thermodynamic computer. So this is our superconducting lab. This is as macroscopic as you can make a thermodynamic computer. Anybody claiming they can do a breadboard in their garage that's a thermodynamic computer, injected synthetic noise, and it's a LARP. <laughs> so we had to go to great lengths to make 
macros as macroscopic of a prototype as we could. This chip is about as big as your thumbnail, but the features are visible. And we have a whole cryogenic lab to fabricate and test these devices. These use superconducting Josephson junctions to create, again, general energy functions over the continuum. Chat, he said the words. That's all I wanted to hear, chat. Superconducting Joseph's injunctions. Yahtzee. So this is why when the man's talking about it's not a it's not a quantum computer, I'm like, what but quantum we just found out that quantum computer is just two Joseph's injunctions built into a squid connected to a capacitor. That's all a qubit is. So when you're telling me, oh, my microchip's totally not a quantum computer, it just it uses all the exact same functionality, all the exact same microchip design. That's where I'm like, uh, okay. I mean, technically you're doing something different, but is it really not a quantum system? Mm, okay. Chip is about as big as your thumbnail, but the features are visible. And we have a whole cryogenic lab to fabricate and test these devices. These use superconducting Josephson junctions to create, again, general energy functions over the continuum. And this is, there's a whole movie online. You can check it out. We showed our fab and lab and how we've manufactured these devices. Yeah. But essentially where you to scale a massive superconducting supercomputer you can have the most energy efficient transformer you can build. And so that's probably for us, this was a stepping stone. This was like our breadboard. So a superconducting computer is the most efficient system you can possibly build. Why? Because superconductivity has no resistance. No resistance means there's no energy loss due to heat. That's as efficient as it gets, chat. Well, not quite, but as close as you can get from a standard thermodynamic standpoint. Prototypes of this fab is in Sherbrooke. Uh, on the left is our chip. So, you know, we have 25 patents and counting on this, on this paradigm. So come talk to us if you're interested in scaling this. So that's our first thermodynamic computer. This is a programmable energy-based model device. We're actually, I'm announcing today that we're going to be open sourcing the blueprint for the software and hardware. So how we did, how we could do all sorts of algorithms and how we can map algorithms onto superconducting okay, sweet okay one last thing we're gonna so there's a brand new video they played so that was what i wanted there's a little bit more about the wobbly physics and utilizing brownian motion like three minutes into the video uh but that's fine i think i kind of explained it so this is i think their lead engineer i don't think this is the founder but their lead engineer the other the one the other guy basically and he kind of explains some of the science behind what they're doing here like what is extropic doing what, this is what we're trying to understand. What, what is this actually doing? Leverage that hardware efficiently to do something similar to ChatGPT or MidJourney, right? So the neural networks we have today, like transformers, are really built to leverage specific things about GPUs. Um, and if you build, so if you build a new type of hardware, you also have to build a new type of algorithm to go along with it. And so where are we now? Well, over the last two years, uh, we've kind of built a version zero of everything I just told you about. We've built chips that let us test these new probabilistic circuits in the lab, right? So it's not just theory. We've actually built them and validated that they work how we think they should, which was a lot harder than you'd think because you know, all circuits have noise, but it's a whole other matter to actually use that noise to do something useful reliably. We've integrated those chips into simple systems. So you know, we package our chips, built boards around them, um, built interfaces from the talk to FPGAs, kind of do hybrid algorithms. And then we've also done a bunch of work on the machine learning side to figure out how to leverage this new type of processor to do something Something useful in generative AI. So all that's been done over the last two years, and what that gets us is this plot here, which shows that simulations of a chip we're building now could be around 10,000 times more efficient than a VAE running on a GPU on some simple generative AI benchmark. Now, great. Okay. So basically, we did a bunch of research. Where are we going? Well, now it's all about scale. We've built these simple systems, so now we have to scale up both the hardware and the algorithms to raise the capabilities of our systems to be more comparable to what you can do with LLMs today, right? You know, everything we've done so far has been extremely scale small scale. The company's only around 15 people, and those people are split between integrated circuit design, statistical physics research, and machine learning. Okay, now, let's get a little bit more specific about what each of those new things is, right? So what do I mean by a new type of integrated circuit processor? Well, again, an integrated circuit is just a chip made out of a bunch of transistors that you can get from TSMC. So there's nothing exotic like quantum computing or photonics. The way it is different from what exists today is mostly architecturally. So a GPU is essentially a giant array of floating point multiply accumulate units that get orchestrated. So he's saying that instead of it being a quantum chip using quantum mechanics, it's more like a standard GPU, standard processor, but it uses a different mechanism. Here we go. Created by some central controller to implement things like matrix multiplication for deep learning. That's great for doing neural networks. Our new type of processor is called a thermodynamic sampling unit. A thermodynamic sampling unit is extremely different from a GPU in that instead of being a large array of floating point multiply accumulate units, it's actually a giant array of sampling cells, right? So a thermodynamic sampling unit looks like this picture on the right where you have a bunch of cells and within each cell, you have some kind of specialized sampling circuitry that implements ultra-efficient random number generation. 
you have some circuitry that computes the parameters of that random number generation process, such as the bias of flipping a coin, and you have a register that stores the state of the program. And so when you roll out a program on a TSU, what basically happens is all of these cells talk to each other and orchestrate some kind of sampling procedure to uh, sample from some computationally useful probability distribution. What do I mean by probabilistic circuit? Well, traditional circuits compute functions, right? So if you have an... Okay, I think we'll probably call it there. It's already getting a little bit too deep for me. <clears throat> but what he's saying is that instead of actively inputting our data, instead of having our input be, in, as he describes in that uh, screenshot, matrix and a vector, he's saying, instead, we just have these sensor units. These sensor units that are sampling units, they're just sampling the data that's already out there. So it does seem like they're quite literally just measuring the ether. Now, in this case, it's not the zero point energy ether. They're measuring the thermal fluctuations that are occurring. And then they're using that as their resource instead of creating their own binary ones and zeros through an input. So if you take the input away and you just sample the parameters and the data that's already there, then, of course, that becomes a lot more efficient. So I think that's probably the most important takeaway. If we if we really go high level on this and say, what is the big takeaway from this entropic, entro entropic, right? Extropic chip is that it is sampling energy that's already out there instead of inserting energy to create a result, right? Sampling the energy that's already out there instead of inputting energy to create a specific result. My last thought of the night on this is if I was developing a sentient AI, an AI that meets the three criteria that Salvatore Pais mentioned, the what do you call this? The triarchy of sentience. What did he say? He said, number one, number one is you need to have energy. You need energy to be able to pull this off. You need the processing capability to pull this to this stuff off. I would say, okay, we've got that met. Number two, we need the ability to have good data, good vector analysis, I think they call it. We need to be able to pull the best sources. Okay, that's also pretty easy. The third one is the hardest one, creativity. Ultimately, when we talk about creativity, I equate that to randomness. Can a computer produce true randomness? When a computer can produce true randomness instead of the fake random Monte Carlo thing they do right now, that could be seen as a form of creativity, unique inspiration, new content that's original. I think that sentient AI will only come from microchips that sample the ether. If our consciousness exists in the ether, if we are just receivers and we're tuning in to our consciousness, then these kinds of microchips would be exactly what's needed for a sentient computer to also tap into that consciousness, in my opinion.